You're listening to TIP. Welcome to The Good Life. I'm your host, Sean Murray. Today, we examine one of the critical skills to achieving the good life, and that is decision making. We're going to explore this topic in a new format. I've invited three experts on decision making Annie Duke, the author of Thinking in Bets, Jake Taylor, a value investor and the author of The Rebel Allocator, and a previous guest on The Good Life, and Brent Snow, who teaches decision making to executives in corporate America. We're calling this a decision mastermind group, and it's a lot of fun. We cover a concept Andy calls resulting, and it's related to the idea that the quality of the outcome doesn't tell you everything about the quality of the decision. We talk about wicked and kind feedback environments. We discuss the role that luck and hidden information play in decision-making and why decision pre-work is better than a decision journal, and so many more topics. Stick around to the end when we discuss topics for future mastermind discussions. You don't want to miss this one. I hope you enjoy this mastermind discussion as much as I did. So let's get started. You're listening to The Good Life by the Investors Podcast Network, where we explore the ideas, principles, and values that help you live a meaningful, purposeful life. Join your host, Sean Murray, on a journey for the life well lived. Welcome to The Good Life and to the Decision Making Mastermind Group. The purpose of this episode is to bring together a panel to explore decision making and how we can get better. There's a great quote from Ray Dalio. It's in his book, Principles. He says, the quality of our lives depends on the quality of our decisions. And I think he's spot on. As you know, the ethos and the mission of The Good Life is to help us all get the most out of life, to help us attain the life well lived. And one component of that, maybe the biggest component of that is decision making. So it's a worthy pursuit to spend our time examining our decision making, learning from others, and striving to continuously improve how we make decisions. In the spirit of that, I brought together three friends of the show who've thought and written deeply about decision making. Joining us today is Annie Duke, a former professional poker player and the author of Thinking and Bets. She also has a new book coming out this fall called How to Decide. Annie, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Jake Taylor is an investor and he runs Farnham Street Investments. He's been a guest on the podcast before talking about his novel, The Rebel Allocator, which has a theme of decision making as well. So Jake, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Brent Snow, the founder of 10,000 Feet, a company that develops learning experiences and teaches leadership and decision-making to organizations. Brent, thanks for joining. Thanks, Sean. Well, Annie, I thought I'd start with a question for you. In your book, Thinking in Bets, which was a wonderful book, and I learned a lot from reading the book, but one of the tools that you talk about is something you call resulting, which I had not heard of before, but it ended up having a big impact on how I think about decision-making. So I thought we'd start with just that particular aspect of decision-making. I'm going to offer you sort of a paradox that I call the the paradox of experience. And what is that? It's that in order to become a better decision-maker, you need experiences in your life, right? You need to have made decisions and see how they turn out and get feedback from that and kind of iterate. So experience is necessary for becoming a better decision maker. But the paradox is that any individual experience that you might have can actually really interfere with learning. And the reason for that is that for most decisions that we make, the quality of the outcome is not correlated at one with the quality of the decision that preceded it. And there's kind of two influences that kind of get in the way. One is luck, which is just when you make a decision that determines the set of possibilities that could occur and the probabilities at which you might observe those, but it doesn't determine which one you're going to see. Right? So I could make a decision that 95% of the time it will work out well, 5% of the time it will work out poorly. And just mathematically speaking, of the time, I'm going to observe the poor outcome and I have no control over when that will happen. I just know it will happen 5% of the time. So that's the luck element. And then there's also this influence of hidden information. I don't generally making decisions with all the information I would need in order to perfectly determine what that set of possibilities is. 
and what the probabilities of those things are. And on the hidden information piece, there's often just information that isn't available to us or would cost too much or we're not even aware we wouldn't need. And in those cases where it's not available, if that information would have an influence on the outcome, it wouldn't mean anything about our decision quality because the information just wasn't available to us. So we have these two things that are kind of mucking up the decision. And essentially what happens, particularly because of the luck element, is that if we think about the four ways in which decision quality and outcome quality can relate to each other, all four are possible. You make a good decision, have a good outcome, could run through a green light and everything's fine. You could have a good decision that has a bad outcome. I could go through that same green light and someone coming the other way in the intersection could hit me. I could make a poor decision and have a perfectly good outcome. I've run red lights before by mistake and gotten through the intersection unscathed. And I could make a poor decision rather and and actually have a bad outcome. So we can call those like earned rewards would be good, good. Just desserts would be bad, bad. And then dumb luck would be a bad decision that turns out well. And bad luck would be a good decision that turns out poorly. So we can think about all those relationships. The problem for us as decision makers is that when we see that something happened, good or bad, we're trying to work backwards from the quality of that outcome in order to figure out something about the quality of the decision. And that's really hard when you only have one iteration, when only one thing has happened. For most things, you would need a lot of time to play out and a lot of instances of that particular decision being made in order to work backwards. And this just mucks up our decision-making because we act like these things are really correlated, right? Like when something bad happens, we think about it as a bad decision when we're sort of evaluating somebody else. So as you know, like I I opened the book Thinking in Bets with Pete Carroll choosing a pass play on the last play of the Super Bowl. And of course that gets intercepted and everybody declares him an idiot, but it takes two seconds to do the thought experiment and say, well, if the ball had been caught, then obviously he would have been hailed as a genius. And that's really where the paradox of experience comes in. Well, that story really hurt being a Seattle Seahawks fan. So it was really visceral because I I remember the play. Obviously, everyone in Seattle does. I also remember my reaction and the reaction of most of the fans in Seattle, which was exactly like you said. Wow, that was a boneheaded play. It was a stupid decision. And There's even a quote, I think, worst decision ever in the Super Bowl was one of the headlines that you pointed out. And I was sort of going along with that narrative until you brought up the second half of that story, which is if you really break down that decision, it's not such a bad decision. If you look at everything that was going on, it was, yeah, it was on the two yard line and it was second down. There was only 26 seconds left. There was only one timeout. And not to get into all of the, uh, intricacies of football, but there's a good case around time management and creating the best possible option to win the game that that was a good decision. And Pete Carroll's quote was so revealing. And you quote it in the book, he said, it's not that it was the worst decision in football history. It was the worst decision outcome in the history of the Super Bowl, potentially the worst decision outcome. And I think that tells me that he really sort of gets it as far as decision making understanding resulting and decoupling the one-to-one relationship between the outcome and the decision. You know, and the thing is that like, you can see this kind of all over the place. Like actually in my new book, I talk about the reaction to the 2016 election and the Clinton campaign's decision-making around where she was campaigning. We know that she lost Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. So, So we know that that's the outcome. And I noticed after the election that there were just a lot of think pieces and a lot of pundits on television talking about how terrible her decision was to campaign in Florida and North Carolina and Virginia and Arizona and New Hampshire and not spend all of her time in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. When you look at the polling from before then, all of these states that looked very, very close, like Florida and New Hampshire. So we can look at what the information was that anybody would have had to work with at the time. And it turned out that obviously Trump won those, a couple by very, very narrow margin, certainly in the case of Wisconsin, a very narrow margin. 
they ended up being sort of relative ties. So there seemed to be a polling error that was going on. But of course, the thing about polling errors is that you can't know about them until after the fact, right? So I thought to myself, well, this is a really good example of like crowdsourcing and decision making. And what I thought was, well, given that there was this huge ability for people to actually examine this decision before the fact, which is different than the Pete Carroll situation, right? Pete Carroll, everybody's watching that in real time and they don't have time to actually do a lot of analysis on this. But in the case of Clinton, you have months and months and months for pundits and experts and political consultants and everybody to be writing these pieces and get on CNN and write op-eds to talk about how terrible her strategy was. So I just did a little Google search because I was curious. And indeed, thousands of articles come up about how bad her decision quality was. The weird thing is that the date of the first one is November 9th and the election was on November 8th. I mean, clearly that decision was crowdsourced. Everybody was analyzing the election. Everybody was analyzing the decision making. And weirdly, no one wrote down these thoughts. So that's like clearly resulting that everybody says, oh, that was such a bad decision, but apparently nobody thought so beforehand. But then what's interesting is that you can add to this ruckus in terms of the paradox of experience with hindsight bias, which is like, oh, no, I knew that. Because when you read the articles, most of them say, and everybody knew it. It's like, okay, but if everybody knew it, someone would have written a piece about it. And I think it's such a good example of how much we get tripped up by this experience that paradoxically is the only thing that we can use in order to get better at our decision making. And this really, I think, is the primary problem as we go into figuring out how to make better decisions. I'm curious to ask Annie a question if she has any kind of a gut sense of just across a broad swath of domains, what do you think would be an in that you would need? How big of a sampling to sort of get a little more comfortable about making a prediction? So the N that you need completely depends on the variance. So you would need to know the standard deviation. You'd also need to know a little something about the shape of the distribution, right? So in order to be able to tell what the, in order to be able to understand what the end would need. So you just need to understand the variability. So just as an example, like for me to find out if we play chess, for me to find out who's better, I need an N of one. We can play once. <laughs> but for poker, for example, if I play eight hours of poker, say in a live game, and I have a sizable edge, like I'm 5% better than the table. I think it's something like after eight hours in a live game, not online, you get fewer iterations in a live game. I think I'm going to be winning somewhere between like 54 and 56% of the time I'll be winning. But after, I think it's after a thousand or 1500 hours, I'll be winning 99% of the time. I'll actually have a positive balance sheet. So that gives you an idea, like in poker, you need a lot more time to really have confidence about whether the person actually has an edge or not and to work backwards from that. So you can think about like a 50-50 coin, right? And we can actually work those probabilities out, right? In terms of, well, what are the chances of two heads in a row? That's 25% of the time you're going to observe that result. Three heads in the row was going to be 12.5% of the time. Four is going to be 6.25% of the time, so on and so forth. It's not that crazy to think, oh, you know, we could end up with 10 heads in a row on a totally fair coin. So as we start to increase the volatility, you need to increase the end. When you make investment decisions, how many are you making in a year, Jake? How many times are you actually putting money on the line in investment? For me, I'm more of a Warren Buffett style of investor. So it's small. Like, I mean, two good ideas in a year would be okay. I would say Buffett's typically less than five and there's often years where there's zero. So the N is very, very small as a sample size for this type of investing that I like to do. But if you're a day trader, I mean, you could be making hundreds of decisions a day and you can get your in up at a much faster rate. And you can lose your money pretty fast. I'm going to give you a kind of contrarian opinion, which is that while you might only make two investments in a year, two things are true. One is you're still making thousands of decisions. And if you can capture that data, that you can actually become a better decision maker much more quickly because really everything is kind of like options trading. It's just that you're doing more no's than yeses. So I hear that a lot. You know, well, this is very different because I only make two decisions a year. And I'm like, no, that's not true. You make thousands. And so if we want to think about the omissions too, and how are we capturing that? 
And what's nice about the omissions is that there's less risk to you, right? In order to track that data, in order to become better. The other thing that's also true is that when you hold an investment, after you hold that investment, you're making choices about whether to press in that same domain, whether to hedge against it. If there's liquidity to the investment, you're making choices about whether you would like to liquidate that investment or not. And those choices are all happening along the way. So you would want to be recording those as well. The other thing is that when you make an investment, there are implications as to why that have to do with things that will be true about the world, some of which are would be on a very short time horizon, where you can start to actually be very mindful of thinking about what am I thinking about beforehand in terms of what my ideas are about what the world will look like, that I can then close the loop in a way that will allow me to overcome the paradox of experience because I'm going to know exactly what I thought. I'm going to know what my predictions were. And we can think about that like back to the Clinton thing. The reason why I understand there was a problem is because there's an evidentiary record. When everybody says, yeah, no, I knew that beforehand. And so did everybody else. I can actually go look. So the more that you can kind of create that for yourself, I think that we get caught up in this idea that we have sort of commission and omission and the things that we commit, which would be the investments we make, loom very large in our cognitive space. And then the time horizon that that investment would actually settle also looms very large in our cognitive space. And so we want to try to pull back from that and try to think about how can we actually be data collectors? How can we create for ourselves the most coin flips possible that we can actually go back and check on? Annie's 100% right. The resulting in the investment world is, it's a resulting orgy. I mean, it's all about returns, right? And that's all everyone wants to talk about. And yet over short periods of time, returns are all over the place. I mean, it's incredibly noisy. Researcher Robin Hogarth separates the world into like kind and wicked learning environments. And the kind learning environment is one where feedback is immediate. It's unambiguous and tells you whether you did the right thing or not. And think about like a little kid who's learning how to walk. Like gravity is unrelenting in its immediate feedback of teaching you how to walk. So that's a very kind learning environment, despite maybe some scraped knees. But the investment world is a very wicked environment where there's incredible amounts of noise. Sometimes it takes years for you to figure out whether you were right or wrong. And so it's incredibly difficult to sort of close that feedback loop that might lead to future intuition. So the other thing that I would say would be a best practice based on what Annie just said was that, you know, you can get one year's worth of results by looking at the returns over one year for an idea. However, you can also be making specific predictions over that same time period about fundamentals about a business, let's say. Phil of Tetlock's work is basically what I'm going to be telling you right now, but there's three things that make for a good prediction. You have to have an unambiguous, clearly defined outcome. I like to think about it like you're either pregnant or you're not. There's no like a little bit pregnant and you want your prediction to also be pregnant or not pregnant. You want to assign a probability to it. So you're thinking probabilistically. And that's where Andy's idea about when you say want to bet about something that gets people thinking in kind of a probabilistic mindset. Also, you have to have a very definite time horizon because it's very easy for you to say like, well, it was going to happen, but it just hasn't happened yet. Right. So those three components put together. So let's say that I would say there's a 70 percent chance that Apple's profit margins will grow by 5 percent by January 1st, 2021. That's a good prediction. It has all three of the hallmarks. We're going to be able to tell whether it's true or not. Now, we could also turn to this a statistician turned meteorologist whose name was Glenn Breyer. And what he came up with was this idea of this uh, called a Breyer score. And it's a two-factor scoring system. You have the probability that you assign to a particular outcome and then whether it occurred or not. And what's really nice about this is that it gives you both how accurate are you, but also where is your confidence on your predictions? And most of us tend to be overconfident about what we think that we understand the world. We're taking a very wicked learning environment and we're making it a little bit kinder. So if you came up with five individual, hopefully things that would be sort of key drivers about a particular investment outcome, like profit margin or market share or a lot of different things that maybe correlate with a good outcome, we could actually grow the N at a five to one rate as far as assessing, do we have luck or skill by taking a snapshot of our predictions as opposed to just purely our results. 
Yeah, that's a great insight. To get alpha or to get a return in the market that is better than the market, you're going to need some kind of insight that's different than the consensus. And that's what you're getting at, Jake. You're testing your ability to gain some kind of insight and being able to bet on that insight. Yeah. And the other thing I like to think about is like the universe of potential outcomes is incredibly wide. And so you have, I would say, like millions of strands of the future that fuse together in the present to form this rope of history. And each different investment strategy that you could affect, you basically like different investment decisions will have different potential outcomes across millions of the potential futures. So you can design for different things. Do you want to design for resilience, which would be a good outcome across a bigger swath of the rainbow of outcomes? Or do you want to use optimization, which would be like the best average across the millions of potential outcomes? But maybe there's a big subset in there where it's a really bad outcome. So we're always kind of making trade-offs in our resilience versus optimization. And I think people would be well served to think about their, especially the investment world with as much noise and crazy things that can happen. You can have a pandemic breakout that no one saw coming. Lots of different potential outcomes. So I think it's important that people think through these a little bit more that, and not just look at the result of, well, here's the return for the year. Like there's so many other ways that that could have gone. Although there will, of course, be people who will be emerging and they'll say, I knew this was coming. And there's lots of articles out there already by people saying, I predicted this. I don't know if you have read range, but David Epstein actually did predict it. I mean, Jake, obviously I'm a huge fan of Phil Tetlock's work and I completely agree with you. And I think that what's interesting is that sometimes it's not even about unique insights. It's that you just understand your market a little bit better than everybody else and you're able to execute on it more quickly and you're more agile and flexible in the way that you're incorporating the information. It's like two people could have the exact same model of the world and one person, when information comes in, may adapt their model to the new information and another person may adapt the information to their model. So they both have the same kind of insight about the world, but one of them is a better updater than the other one based on new information coming in. And I think that, Jake, what you're describing in terms of like making these repeated forecasts that have very, very clear answers as to whether you got it right or not, and you're getting a large enough N that you can really start to test what your calibration is automatically because it's forcing you to think probabilistically in that way and to hold all these different futures in your mind at once. And to also just sort of start thinking about, well, what would have to be true of the world in order for this set of outcomes to the ones that I observe or this set or this set, that it causes you to be more flexible in your thinking and more open-minded. You know, when we have very strong models of the world, and you can see this like with some models in terms of investing that worked well in certain environments, maybe not other, like value investing, right? So once you do that, it's kind of dug a cognitive trench for yourself. And it's hard for people to climb out of that trench and sort of stand up and look around the world and say, okay, do I want to change anything? So what Jake is describing, I think, allows you to create that kind of mindset where you're just more likely to be adaptive to the information, insight aside, right? Like It's just you know your market better and you're more open-minded to the information that will allow you to actually develop even more expertise, like an extra like 0.1 BIPs, and those just accrue over time. And once we accrue those over time, you know, obviously you do enough of those and all of a sudden you're like a bit ahead. I'd like to be that. What you described is like this multiverse, right? Like you have to have this multiverse in your head at all times. And then you're always on the lookout for which one am I in? Which timeline do I seem to be on here? And you can only do that by being really attentive to the world. What's nice is that in the investment world, especially, you get a ton of information, what everyone else thinks based on the price you can work backwards in what are the actual business implications that this business would have to do to justify today's price. And there's a ton of information as to what the assumptions are that the rest of the marketplace is making when you work backwards from price. Brent, maybe you could offer a little insight here from the organizational decision-making and the corporate decision-making world, how we can use some of these decision-making tools to improve how we make decisions from an organizational and personal perspective. 
there's a couple of thoughts that I have and as I've been thinking about listening to this conversation and about how this all applies. So one of the things that as we have been teaching decision making, we actually created a course called Decision Mojo and we purposely chose the word mojo because mojo is this kind of almost undefinable but definable. It's this extra strength, this extra skill. You know, you know when you've lost it, you know when you've gotten it in one way or another. And it in many ways describes that extra little edge that you're talking about, Annie. That edge, that something, something, that extra point one bit that adds up over time in one way or another. And so as we are doing this, we are trying to figure out how do we teach leaders, how do we teach managers, professionals and organizations on a day in, day out basis to be better decision makers, to feel more confident as decision makers, to be willing to make bets and make decisions. And conceptually, it completely makes sense to folks that, yeah, we should judge the quality of a decision by the process that was used to get to the decision, not by the result that occurred, because there could be any number of intervening variables. And sometimes in the organizational world, there are months. You make a decision in January, the actual result of that decision, a little bit what you were talking about, Jake, it doesn't occur until some point down the road in the future. And in the meantime, there's been a lot of noise. There's been a lot of other kinds of things that have intervened and caused it to go one way or the other, but you've kind of lost the trail. And so it's hard to get that immediate feedback. Oftentimes, by the time the result occurs, they've kind of lost the trail on some level. People get it conceptually that you should do that. But the challenge is the folks that they report to, their managers, the senior leaders of the organization are often like the pundits who are making comments about Pete Carroll's decision. I often think of the senior leaders as the pundits in that world who immediately go to result. That's the shortcut. That's the way in which they sort of go, okay, that was a good decision or a bad decision. People feel like it doesn't really matter what process I use in many cases, because I know I'm going to get judged on results. And in fact, in organizational life, people say, we judge you on results. You get your performance reviews based on results that you achieved, the results that you've created. And so as we work with managers, we realize that the big challenge is actually to help them, A, feel like they've got a good process and so that they feel confident about they're doing the quality kind of thinking. They're bringing in the different perspectives, the contrarians who are going to challenge them in one way or another, the people who are willing to tell them when they're not thinking about something or bring them disconfirming evidence that they've got a good process, that they've framed a decision in a way that makes sense. They've challenged their frame, that they've used that process well, but the key thing they need to do is they need to be very, very skillful at communicating that process. And in some respects, getting a meta decision made by their leaders about the quality of their process. So the leaders say, okay, we agree you're using a good process to get to this decision. So they buy into an early stage to the process in such a way that when the result occurs, the leaders recognize that it was a good process. And in fact, they wouldn't have probably made any different decision Oftentimes, the leaders are not necessarily privy to that process. They just see the decision in one way or another, or they see the result of the decision. So what we'll do is say, okay, given this particular decision, what's the process that makes sense for this decision? And how are you going to get buy-in on the process? Because at the end of the day, despite your best efforts, you're likely to have a lot of pundits out there, i.e. your leaders, who say, but look at the result. And as much as you've written, and we've all thought about the Pete Carroll, it almost takes the kind of breakdown and analysis and looking at probabilities. And years later, we can do that analysis and say, well, look, this ultimately was a really good decision. But 98% of the world out there isn't on that same journey and hasn't that same perspective in one way or another. And even if you present them with those analysis, they still fight it in one way or another because the result was not what they wanted. I gave a talk at a conference and I've been opening with the video of that play. Great way to open. People like it. People, particularly because, I, you know, I'll put up the still and I'm like, can someone tell me what situation this is? Should have handed it off to Marshawn. Every time gets yelled out. Everybody knows this play. But anyway, so I went through the analysis, right? So when I do that, I don't get like too, too wonky. I mean, it depends on, if I'm talking to financial professionals, you know, I'll talk about that there's options theory that's in here, right? This option for a third play. And what is that? What are you paying for that? But mostly I I just kind of get the audience to understand, like, no matter whether ultimately 
you think it would have been better for them to hand off first or pass first. Like it's under discussion. The idea that this is the worst play in Super Bowl history, which was, as Jay pointed out, or Sean, I guess you pointed out, was one of the headlines, is absurd. I mean, that we should all be able to agree on. So anyway, right after the conference, this guy came up to me and just basically told me I was wrong. And I sort of said, but, you know, and I kind of walked through it again. And then I said, and, you know, Bill Belichick has defended the play, right? He was interviewed about it. They asked him, oh, didn't you get lucky that Pete Carroll called such a horrible play? And he said, actually, that was an excellent play. And I probably would have called that myself. So Belichick thinks it's a good play. And he went, that's all. We're done here. It was bad. I mean, if you're at the very, very top of the organization, you have the luxury of saying, and particularly if you're a man, by the way, as well, well, I took a risk, didn't work out. We learned from it and we're going to go forward. It's like, I know for myself, even it's like, I've presented that video so many times when I watch it, I feel it right. I think about Clinton's campaign strategy. I feel it. I feel that, well, of course she was stupid for not campaigning in those three states. And I have to get into a different part of my brain. So I'm sort of battling it all the time. Michael Mobison talks about this really eloquently, that there's a part of the brain that's been shown like neurologically called the interpreter. And basically, when you're in the process of making a decision, this particular part of your brain isn't engaged. But once you see an outcome, that's when it's engaged. And what it's trying to do is it makes sense of the world for you. It's trying to find causality, trying to figure out what the connection is, right? And so the interpreter is not happy with well, there were lots of ways that this could turn out and this happened to be one of them. That's not really what it's trying to accomplish. It's trying to accomplish, you know, I took the pool cue and I hit the white ball and the white ball collided into the blue ball that caused it to go into the pocket. It's just trying to settle it. And then I think the other problem is that a lot of the things about which we think, and this is true of the Pete Carroll thing as well, while they might be probabilistic in nature, they settle to one or zero. So I can say there's a 30% chance of rain in the forecast area, and the next day it either rains or it doesn't. It settles to one or zero. And I think that it's very hard for the interpreter, for our brain to like, it wants to say, okay, it settled to one or zero. So now that, now I figure out what caused that. I think that that makes it really hard because we can't see 30% except over time. We see that it rained or it didn't. Right. It's like this outcome that is actually swaying everything else, all the interpretation, that's like this magnetic force at one or zero that just sort of pulls how we interpret everything that happened before, that we, one way or another, may have been thinking very differently, but now we're thinking this way. I think that you're exactly right, Brent. Yes, this idea of a decision process review, it's so important. We can learn so much from stepping back and assessing our decisions and our decision process and our model. And then using the information from the outcome of the decision to update our process and our model. But it's challenging, right? Because we don't often take the time to do it. Or when we do take the time to do it, we aren't honest with ourselves. We revert to resulting. And you bring up an interesting thought experiment to get us to think about what exactly is the thing that triggers a decision process review. You say, imagine we all work for a commercial investment firm and we have a model that predicts our investment is going to be up 20% in market value in two years. And then you imagine fast forwarding two years, right? And maybe I'll let you set this up since it's your thought experiment. So it's two years down the road and let's say it appraises at 10 or 15% less what our model predicted. I think we can all imagine that we're in a room. It's a very long meeting. If it's a better company, they're going to be talking about the model and the process for making the decision to invest, they're going to say, I know, I know, I don't care that it lost. We don't care. But we want to figure out what's going on with our model. Because obviously, we think our model was wrong. So let's really dig into it, right? And it's a very, very long meeting. So now let's do the thought experiment that we do the exact same thing. We say, we really think that commercial real estate is being undervalued right now. We're going to build an office building. We have it appraised at X dollars in two years. That's what our model says. We finish the project and it appraises 10 or 15% higher than what our model said. Are we in a room that doesn't involve champagne, by the way? Is it a two hour long meeting about what was wrong with our model? Should we need to be examining it? Was this just a tail event? Was our model off? Why did it do so much better than we expected? 
Was it for reasons that we could predict or was it orthogonal to the reasons that we thought? So on and so forth. So what we can see is that there's an asymmetry in what is the thing that's triggering process reviews? Because like Jake, to your point, like Phil Tetlock will tell you, you can't allow process to live in a box just because outcomes are probabilistic in nature doesn't mean you get to say, well, I thought we would observe that result 5% of the time when we actually observed it 5% of the time. Like in the case of the polling error with Clinton, you know, with that election, not Clinton, particularly across those three states, you don't want to just say, well, you know, our polling is variable and there's a margin of error. You want to actually go look and look at them. You want something to trigger the look, right? But you want it to trigger the look whether the poll overestimated or underestimated what the population of the vote was because underallocation is just as bad a problem as overallocation, number one. So you don't want to be doing either of those things. Two, it's the case that you're losing half of your opportunities to learn and examine and try to figure out, like, how can I refine my model? And you don't want to lose half your learning opportunities. But three, and this is the really bad one to Brent's point, what are you communicating to the people who work for you? Don't you go doing that. And we're going to be quizzing you about it right? because we know from Kahneman and Dabursky's work on prospect theory that the chance that you might be in the room having everybody toast champagne to you doesn't even compare to that time in the room where you're like having to defend the decision that you make, how that interacts with innovation. So if we go back to the Pete Carroll example, I'm going to put this thought experiment to you. Pete Carroll hands it off to Marshawn Lynch, just like everybody wants. Hands it off to Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Lynch fails to score. So he calls the timeout, which he would have to do. And he, again, does what everybody expects him to do. Hands it off to Marshawn Lynch a second time, and the Patriots line holds. Is there a headline that says, worst call in Super Bowl history now? Probably not. It's better to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. (laughs) Good point. What do you think is more likely? You know, it's the worst call in Super Bowl history. What was he thinking? Or this is why Belichick is going to be in the Hall of Fame. The Patriots defense was too strong. They held the beast at the goal line for the win. Where do we think those headlines are going to go? And this becomes a problem as it interacts with this issue of are we in the room for bad outcomes or good outcomes, right? So we're only in the room for bad outcomes. And that's only a problem if it's unconventional, which can be because you didn't have full consensus. So now that causes consensus speaking or false consensus speaking or, you know, the kind of the worst version of consultants who just sort of are brought in to defend a decision that somebody wants to make so they can say, no, look, we did the work. Or what I would say happens increasingly in organizations, we call it consensus overdosing. You basically cover your every base and you bring everybody in. And so if it goes bad, it's like, oh, well, look at everybody else who was involved for status quo, which is the safe place to go because how can you fault the status quo? If you make a consensus or a status quo or conventional decision and you fail, it's like, yeah, that's bad luck. You do well, it was like, okay. So you're literally, you're hovering around the middle But if you do a Pete Carroll thing and you do something really, really unusual and you succeed, sure, you get called a genius. We see this all the time in Silicon Valley, right? Like genius. But the problem is when it fails, you're called an idiot. And that quadrant that we're so afraid of, we just kind of try not to lose, which is a horrible way to live your life, right? It's like, how can I just de-risk at every turn? You're not going to do very well doing that. Right. So one is that your employees, the people on your team in your own life, you'll do this to yourself because you make these same judgments to yourself. It doesn't take another person to do it. You're going to be just kind of de-risking all the time. That's number one. And then number two is that you're going to remove career risk with the kinds of things that you just said, Brent. Jeff Bezos gets this right. If you've seen some of his quotes, they did something at Amazon about 10 years ago called the Fire Phone. And it failed miserably. And it was a billion dollar bet, multi billion dollar bet potentially. He was asked about it. What do you think, Jeff, of this failure, this terrible outcome? And he said, Well, we're going to have a lot bigger failures in the future. And if we're not seeing those kinds of failures, then we're not making the right kinds of bets. And that's a very different 
mindset from your leadership. If you're at Amazon and you want to place a bet, if you want to invest in something that's going to be innovative, creative, and involve risk and uncertainty, knowing that you've got someone who thinks about risk in that way is going to clear the way culturally for that innovation. So Sean, here's the question, and I don't know that we can totally know the answer, but if you're in the middle of the organization, if you're in the middle of Amazon, you're not Jeff Bezos, do you feel that same freedom? And it might not be a billion dollar bet, but it might be a million dollar bet. Do you feel that same freedom to take that kind of risk, make that kind of mistake, or have it not even make the mistake, but have it not go well and end up in that quadrant that you were describing, Annie? When you're at the top of the organization, you can do it. And then you can talk about it later and say, hey, we just learned something really valuable and that's really important. And I think what the challenge is for folks who are in the middle of the organization, they can, to some extent, maybe if they're great managers and leaders, they can, in fact, with their team, the people who directly report to them, this culture of experimentation, say, listen, I'd rather you take the risk, make a decision, go forward, learn from it, make changes quickly, whatever it is. But then if their leaders, their managers don't have that same mindset, they feel like they're going to have to somehow manage the risk that they're allowing their employees to take because ultimately it reflects back on them. They're going to be called to the table for that long and painful meeting to explain that one time where it didn't go well. It's hard. They get frozen. They go into consensus overdosing by bringing everybody into the decision or they feel like they have to have 100% of the information versus 70% of the information. And so it's teaching people to somehow feel confident enough to still make a call in a world where they feel like they're going to get called to the carpet when it doesn't necessarily turn out exactly as they planned is the real challenge. I've started using the term, and actually it is one that seems to have a fair bit of resonance, that if you are feeling stuck and you're afraid to make a decision because you're afraid that ultimately once you make a decision, there's now going to be something that happens or result. Think of decisions as experiments with the future reframing your decision, not as, oh my God, it's going to go one way or the other way. And what if I get it wrong? But just think of it as in this, this kind of positive experiment with the future where you're going to get data back and also try to put the decision out there in a way where there's some ability to make adjustments and learn from it and bring it back in in one way or another. And just that simple language shift of what if I get this wrong? And so then I default to this status quo and I don't make a decision or I consensus overdose or information overdose, or I do all that other stuff and then ultimately don't make the decision. Instead, I think of it as this positive foray into the future. It's an experiment with the future and I'm going to get feedback one way or the other. And like all experiments, sometimes it doesn't work out exactly. You know, you form a hypothesis, you have a prediction that you're making. And the best of all, you also document that prediction. You know, you actually say, okay, here are my assumptions. Here are the things that I believe. Here's why I'm making this decision. Then you go back and revisit those assumptions or revisit what you were thinking when you made the prediction. And then you obviously hopefully get better and better and better over time as you do that. I love what you said. Actually, Tim Harford really talks a lot about this idea of experimenting, like thinking about decisions as experiments. And God, there's so much good stuff that you just said in there. I love it. So the first thing I just want to kind of circle back to when you said, like, if you actually have a record, right? what I really like to think about is that if you're actually instituting good process and a decision, a record naturally gets created. So I actually am not a big fan of like decision journals in the sense of like, I'm going to make a decision write it down. I talk about it as pre-work, right? Like pre-work is the way that I frame it as opposed to a journal. Because I feel like a journal is, it's a little bit of a diary and it feels like extra work. But if you think about a good decision process is going to create an evidentiary record, which will be the same as a journal but it creates a good evidentiary record for you to be able to go look back on, then it doesn't feel like extra work because you're doing something that is in the creation problem of the decision. And part of that is what you're talking about, Brent, which is what type of decision are you facing, which tells you how experimental can I get? And if you really think about the type of decision that you're facing, it frees you up because you're framing the impact of the decision, right? Is this, as you said, what's the impact going to be? What's my optionality? Those are the two things that you should really care about as you're going into that. And once you realize, like, I'm kind of in a low impact situation with lots of optionality, you should be able to get an organization to start moving very quickly because now the defense is, well, we thought about what type of decision it was. We just need to identify the decision environment. 
And that told us how far up the chain we needed to even be thinking about this. But then I also want to go back to this thing that you said about people kind of wanting to get to 100% on a decision. And the thing is that I think that people forget about time as a commodity and that when you're entering any decision, there's a trade-off between time and accuracy or time and certainty. Certainly, we really want to be thinking about that, right? Because that can get us into this situation where we end up making no decision and that, you know, and you're accruing risk by not making a decision over the time that you don't make a decision. I'm just as much as you would be if you make the decision itself, right? Either way, you've got risk accruing. And in general, what we'd like to do is be able to speed things up if possible, because sometimes the best information you can get is how it turns out. We live in a world that's so data rich. I think it used to be like when I was growing up, it was like, well, let's just go to this restaurant, right? Now it's, we got to go on Yelp. We have to examine every restaurant in the area. Everything is reviewed. Got to go read some of the reviews. And that, you know, because we have this idea that with enough data, if we just got one more piece of information, if we just looked a little harder, that maybe we could get to that 100% sure. And so I think that, again, another paradox is that the amount of data that we have available to us now can actually slow decision-making down in a really bad way. It encourages the illusion that we can get to 100%. But if you think about it as an example, like if I'm in a restaurant and I'm trying to order between the chicken and the fish, there's not a lot that I can find out that's going to tell me whether I actually like that dish beyond ordering it, having it in front of me, and tasting the food. And there's so many decisions that are like that. I just have to taste the food. Then you can take that and work backwards and say, well, if I do have a really high impact decision on the horizon, what are the small experiments that can run in front of that in order to actually build a better model of the world outside of just trying to accumulate information about base rates, which is important, but doesn't give you the answer? Well, it can sometimes, right? If it certainly, if there's no skill involved, base rates are certainly the only thing I would want to know. But assuming there is skill involved, it's not necessarily going to give you the answer. And now I can think about how can I kind of date before I marry in this particular decision, right? If I'm going to make a really a liquid investment, what are the smaller things that I can do in front of that that can help me to understand when I actually have to make the investment that's going to be very illiquid and incredibly impactful in my decision making life? Like I just wanted to sort of circle back to a few of those things. What you said, Brent, was just so jam-packed with amazing stuff. (laughs) Jake, how do you date before you marry in the investment world? I love that analogy, by the way. People will paper trade. That's sort of one way of doing it. You can just scale down all your position sizing as a way. There's this kind of idea that you really don't know a company until you've owned it for a while. I found that to be true. You can do all the research that you want, but once you actually own it, then you're like, oh man, I really need to know this now, right? (laughs) Some people will, they'll like unlock how much of the portfolio that you're willing to dedicate to an idea over time as you come to know it better. So you can scale yourself into it as you hopefully capture more of the total information that would affect your outcomes. So if you think about options and impact, right, that's a way to reduce impact. The more you can reduce impact, the more quickly you can go. It's safer to be deciding where essentially your accuracy is just going to be lower because you don't quite know as much as you're actually using it as an information gathering tool, right? And so if you're thinking in those two categories, options and impact, the more liquid something is, the faster you can, like, I can just go because I can just get right out of it, right? If I find new things out and then if you can lower impact, make a lot of small bets while you're building your model before you make the really big bet just to get the information. And you can actually sort of work backwards, right? So you can say, if we're really interested in this particular area or particular company, kind of what's the minimum amount that we would have to invest in order to be able to get access to that information? If we layer in another level of complexity when it comes to investing, especially value investing, Jake, as you are getting to know this company, if the stock price is continuing to increase, you're going to have some regret potential. You're going to have hindsight bias. Why didn't I go in bigger earlier? Or... Alternatively, if the stock price is going down as you're learning more about the company, if you continue to like what you're learning, you should be celebrating. Like Warren Buffett says, you know, tap dancing and doing a little dance, like, all right, that the price of the stock's going down. Woohoo. But those are hard mental states and emotional states to put yourself in because they go counter to, you know, obviously your 
your hindsight bias or your potential net worth as you think about it? I'm actually a little bit pessimistic that we will be able to overcome some of these challenges. Because I think we're actually fighting biology in a lot of ways. For instance, like the decision making on, like, let's say you were the leader of a little tribe a million years ago. You lived in a world, first of all, that was very Newtonian. And there was a lot more sort of like cause and effect that was closer together. Like we found the animal, we killed it, we got to eat dinner. There wasn't as much of some of these long, like the tails, I think, were a little bit more narrow than they are today in such an interconnected world. A global pandemic being a good example of everything's so interconnected now that we're living in more complex systems than we did at that time. So if you were the leader of that tribe and there's something crazy happens, you know, left tail event, that's an act of God, right? Like you just blame God for that one or the gods. Whereas now to put yourself into either one of the tails, good or bad outcomes, requires you to really kind of go against your biology and probably how leadership evolved over time. Like it was better to have the consensus that everyone agreed that, yeah, we're going to move the camp over here. And that, you know, you're kind of sharing the risk a little bit there. And if you went out on your own and said no one else wanted to, and you did it, like maybe your head ends up on a spike at that point. Right. So I think we're fighting a lot of our biology to do some of these best practices. doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but I think we have to be cognizant of that. That's a great note maybe to end on this idea that, and you brought it up, that we're constantly battling to overcome hindsight bias, to overcome this idea that we need to decouple the outcome, judging a decision purely by the outcome and not looking at the process. That reminds us all that it's a learning process. We need to document decisions, go back and look and see how we did. Think about the process and not just the outcome. It's a call to continually learn about decision-making and hopefully reconvene again in the future and continue our discussion about how to get better because we've unlocked and uncovered so many different threads and angles in decision-making that we could explore as a group. So let me just jump in. So let me just give a couple of things that would be great angles to explore. I think there's a whole angle that we just touched on about risk and taking risk and gender in decision-making that I think is a powerful angle to explore and how that plays out, particularly as others are perceiving the decision. I think there's this whole angle about helping others overcome that biology, as you described, Jake, you know, in one way or another. I mean, Kahneman would say the traps are going to be there or the biases are going to be there and they're going to fall. Anchoring is going to happen or we're going to do those things naturally in one way or another. Even if we are aware that we're doing them, we're still doing them one way or another. I tend to believe that there are the practices you can put in place and things you can do that help you avoid some of those traps? I think those two things live together because if you take a systems approach to it, basically what you're saying is you're going to do it anyway, so I'm going to create a system where it's very hard for that to impact you. Harder. And then you have to somehow uphold it. And I also think, you know, there's a, probably an opportunity to tell some personal stories. I mean, I know I have been challenged in the last three or four months around making some medical decisions for myself that I've had to apply every little bit of what I know about decision-making to myself. And that is traps all over the place, ultimately making a decision in the context of huge uncertainty and way too much information and multiple opinions who don't all agree with each other in one way or another. And it's been interesting to observe myself in action in that process and also observe how people have responded to me as a decision-maker in that process, bringing the various tools that I have at my disposal from a decision-making standpoint into it in ways that are somewhat different than what they normally experience in terms of the questions I ask and how I narrow down options and how I sort of adjudicate between different risks. And so I think, Sean, I would just say, I think there's certainly opportunity for multiple additional avenues here. This has been fun. I agree. I mean, I think there's so many different solutions that you can put into place with it. We talked a lot about what the problems are. We talked a little bit about how things are generally done, but to Brent's point, there are things that you can really put in place within an organization that can really drastically improve how people are making decisions. You know, I think to Jake's point, the biology is there, but I actually have sort of a hopeful take on it. And from two places, one is You don't have to move a lot to get really big results. That's good news. So if you can overcome your biology like a tiny little bit, you're actually going to be way better off. But also that I think that that natural tribalism and the way that tribe works 
you know, which some has to do with sort of the charisma and the, the confidence of the leader in creating that kind of consensus and whatnot, that you can actually sort of dig into, well, what is Tribe offering you? Like, what are the things that it's actually doing for you? And then turn that on its head so that you reorganize what you would say the epistemology of the tribe is. So tribes are cohering around epistemology, right? Like we're going to move our camp here because we believe that that is correct. And that's the, the belief that you're organizing around that's causing that action to occur. And I think that you can actually be pretty intentional about the epistemology of a group so that you can actually get them to cohere around something that looks more open-minded than it naturally would be. And I'd love to like have a discussion about that. Like, how can you actually sort of create culture around really understanding sort of advantages to tribe? It's why we survived, but there are disadvantages. And so how can you actually try to, to mitigate the disadvantages that come along with it? Just really fun mm-hmm. discussion to have. I just think like there's so much just in everything that Brent and Jake and Sean that you've talked about, like there's so much stuff that you can pull out of that. That's like so amazing. And then get into a real practical application. Because a lot of what we talked about were the problems. We talked a little bit about the solutions, but like even in terms of forecasting, like, okay, so how do you actually do that? Like, how do you create a great forecast, right? So some high level solutions, but how do you actually dig down and get into the nuts and bolts of how you'd actually build that piece of furniture, right? Like you need a dresser. Mm -hmm. Okay, but how? Which I think is just like so fun to talk about. Let's reconvene this group soon and... We'll explore the idea of how we can actually solve some of these problems. This has been just a wonderful conversation. Thank you for being on The Good Life. Thank you, Sean. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I had so much fun. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.